Okay, we are live. Uh, welcome to Google TV's Developer Office Hours Hangout. I'm Crispy, and this is Susanna. Introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, I'm Susanna Chen. I'm doing testing for the uh, Google TV apps. And so far, I've been here for a short time and having fun. <laughs> so Susanna is uh, going to be helping us out, uh, doing a lot of testing of applications. And uh, we're excited to have her on board. So welcome. Uh, a few things in the news today. Well, actually, not today, but over the last uh, week or so. October 8th saw the launch of the new and improved Play Store for Google TV. Uh, this is rolled out as an OTA update, so if you don't have it on your Google TV yet, expect to see it soon. What this is going to do is bring all sorts of wonderful features from Play that haven't been available on Google TV into your Google TV environment. This means Google Play and movies. And uh, essentially what this means for developers is it's going to update a lot of other features uh, involving Google Play. Uh, such as, if I can read this, auto updates, subscription billing, and smart app updates. So I've mentioned a few of these things uh, previously. So they're rolling out with uh, this Google Play update. Also, the Washington Post has revealed its Post TV app on Google TV. Uh, this app gets you access to the latest news from uh, the Washington Post in their app called the or their show called the Fold. So you'll be able to tune in and get lots of uh, fresh and interesting news. Uh, Brazil, we had the Brazilian launch happen recently, and uh, we're very excited to have them on board with uh, Google TV devices. We're seeing a lot of apps getting constructed, and so if you're in Brazil, uh, welcome. Korea, some of you might have heard uh, some mumblings about Korea. We've uh, partnered with, um, uh, what is it, LG U Plus has become the first IPTV provider to offer integrated Google TV box for its subscribers. Uh, Korea becomes the tenth country in which Google TV is available. So this is also very exciting. Some of you may have seen the um, uh, the I guess the notices that went out uh, with uh, Gangnam Style. <laughs> Check it out if you haven't seen it. We have a great blog post. As always, you can go to uh, Google TV. Uh, blogspot.com. Uh, that's where we post a lot of information, uh, usually updated a couple times a week, if not more. Uh, it's a great source to tie in uh, with whatever other information sources you're gathering uh, to find out more about Google TV. Uh, what else is going on? We have the GDG DC ho uh, hosted Google TV on uh, Monday. And uh, Paul Karf and Les Vogel are there right now. Uh, DC Droids was hosting Google TV yesterday at an event that they put on. I saw some really cool pictures. Hopefully, we'll get a blog post out there shortly. Uh, today, there's actually a Google TV test lab going on in DC at the Google offices. So perhaps you're one of the lucky few who got to go and test out your apps and some of the new big screens that are there. I think uh, Paul brought. Uh, one of the LG devices, one of the big 47 inches to test apps on. Uh, we've introduced Susan, which was on my list. Uh, things that are coming up that might be of interest to you, the LA Hackathon is taking place uh, October 26th through the 28th in LA. So uh, if you're in that area and, and possibly interested in participating, uh, send me an email, crispy at google.com. Also, we have the Boulder Meetup, which is happening soon. Boulder Droids Meetup is happening 11-13, so November 13th. And there is a test lab going on in Boulder, uh, similar to the one that's going on in DC right now. That is happening on November 15th. So with that, uh, I'm going to try and tie in my, uh, my presentation here. So bear with me one second while I boot up the, uh, the Hangout. Um, sorry for the dead air here. None of this stuff ever works quite out of the box. While I'm doing this, though, I'm willing to take a live question. So if anybody has one, now is a great time to ask. Everyone goes quiet. Nobody's got a live question? Susan, do you have a question for me? Um, Actually, I do have one question. All right, fire away. Um, how, what would be uh, a way to uh, provide you guys an app to test if that app requires a server in the background, meaning um, I'm building an app for MIPTV right now, and so there's a uh, MIPTV server on one end. And uh, how would you go? How would we go about, you know, me pro uh, providing the app to you guys and get feedback? That's a great question. Um, the the thing that would occur to me to do would be. 
if there was a way you could provide us a test server, either you would set it up and host it, or um, if you had code that could run as sort of a local test server, I realize that might not be possible with all the content, but if there was a way that uh, uh, what you were trying to test could be bundled into something that you could send us as well, that would be a way to go. Um, any insight into how he might solve that? Um, You'd probably be doing the testing, so. Yes, I probably will. Um, it's, it's is the way that they, they submit the application to Google. Yes. And um, I think that that is a channel that um, <clears throat> go through Christian. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Here, here's what I suggest you do. Um, send me an email. Let's let's follow up uh, offline. We'll figure this out, and then you know maybe we'll tell everybody next time we have a hangout uh, how we solve this particular problem because it is interesting, and and I recognize the difficulty in it, um, and I would like to get a solution in place that could handle this for, for other people as well. Um, so I am about ready. I am going to select my desktop to share. For those of you who might not have read the, uh, the call out, uh, what I am going to be presenting today is on advanced video. This is the talk that I gave um, at Silicon Valley Code Camp about two weeks ago now. So let me just get a thumbs up from those in the Hangout. Can you see the presentation on the screen? Awesome. All right. So uh, let's talk about advanced video. I had uh, I'd put this together. So those of you who might do video production might recognize a, a, a picture such as this as you're doing video production. You're out there with your camera or equipment or entire um, studio setup, and you've recorded all your content. Um, this is often a lot of work. You're doing filming, you're coordinating schedules, you're coordinating location, and uh, now you've, you've finished all your post-production, you have to start thinking about distribution, that fun, exciting exercise that helps get that thing that you've worked so hard on out into the world. So now, with, with video distribution um, and Google, we have two different powerful distribution channels, one being YouTube, of course. Um, where you can upload your video and uh, have it accessible to the masses, and there's YouTube clients on all sorts of devices. The one that I'm interested in talking about today, though, is the Google TV platform. And uh, it's exciting because it's making its way into people's homes, which is uh, changing the way people consume content, whether it be YouTube or, or other channels. Um, a few of the supported co uh, encodings for Google TV because once you've produced your video, you have to consider how you're going to compress it and encode it to distribute it. Uh, not all devices are created equal, and not all devices uh, offer the same decoding mechanisms. The, one that Google, the ones that Google TV uh, supports are listed on our site, developers.google.com slash TV. Um, I've captured uh, the pertinent information and put it on this slide. In a nutshell, we support H.264 AVC. Um, so this supports uh, the H.264 high profile HIP uh, 4.1, as well as the H.264 baseline, so BP for uh, AVI. It has limited B-frame support, though, so you have to be careful in, uh, in how you go about encoding it if you're going to use baseline profile. Now, the file types that are included or that are typical for packaging with H.264 include 3GPP, uh, MPEG-TS, uh, Matroska, AVIs, Flash, QuickTime, uh, and uh, MTS files, which is AVC HD. Not all of you are expected to know this. The world of codecs is mind-bogglingly huge. Um, but H.264 is probably one of the most popular uh, standards out there uh, with regards to codecs. Uh, we also support MP4s. This is also, uh, this is kind of a, a legacy codec, I guess you could say, although it does show up in a lot of devices and it's still in active production or active use by production companies right now. Uh, again, the container types uh, for those 3GPP, AVIs, MP4s, DivX, um, probably the one that's most famous for popularizing MP4, uh, and MPEG-TS files. We have some support for VP6 and VP8. Uh, typically, you'll find those in Web, uh, WebM and FLVs. Uh, I'm not going to be covering any of that today. Uh, WMV9s and VC1s, uh, those are for ASF and Windows support, um, or popularized by Windows support. Uh, the container for that is a WMV and an MPEG-TS file. We also have support for uh, MPEG-2. It's 
not really required for buddy boxes, but Blu-ray players, etc., typically use that, so we, we support pass-through. Um, how do codecs work? This is something that I don't think gets another en enough coverage uh, in the stuff that we talk about, so I'm going to briefly go over um, how codecs do their job. Essentially, if you take a picture, you have a lot of pixels. Um, cameras now are multi-megapixel, and all that information for a single frame uh, needs to be stored in a file. The moment you start getting into uh, videos with multiple images all chained together, you'd end up carrying around a lot of redundant information uh, in a moving scene. So video codecs typically take the temporal aspect of all of these images and figure out how to remove those redundancies. So what I have here on the slide is a, what's supposed to represent a bunch of different frames. So if we have one base image, um, call it an iframe, uh, not to be confused with web technology, I'm talking the label of an iframe, um, the next frame that would be displayed is not going to contain all the same information as that iframe. It's only going to contain the deltas between the last frame that was shown and what needs to be shown now. So essentially the changes. Um, some, of the, some of the more advanced codecs, again H.264 being an example, they actually utilize three different types of frames. So you have keyframes, iframes, uh, P frames, which are limited deltas, and B frames, uh, which are even more limited. Now, a P frame is going to look ahead and behind it for what delta metadata it needs to carry with it. And a B frame is only going to look backwards for what delta information to carry with it. All of this together, when you encode all these images, results in a, a more compressed form of, of the video. So all these images are crunch down and you don't carry around all this metadata. Um, and why do we care about this? Well, we care about getting small files for video uh, for a couple reasons. Mainly though, it's for reducing bandwidth. If you have your codec reducing the bit rate uh, to below the bandwidth, you are not going to achieve the best possible quality because you, you've reduced um, the amount of information that's transmitted too far, and there's there's more bandwidth available. Um, likewise, if your bit rate when you're encoding uh, is higher than the available bandwidth, you end up with the buffering screen. So some of you might see video like this uh, if the bit rate is too low, and uh, the other case that happens is the buffering, as I said, and I hate buffering screens, don't you? Yes. They're kind of annoying. Uh, sort of degrades the whole experience overall. Um, so the reason I'm talking about all this is because a lot of the content distribution that goes on in Google TV, is, is it happens over IP. And not everyone's bandwidth is created equal. And you should really take into account um, how much somebody might be paying for that bandwidth or what availability they have. Geographically, uh, people in, in less populated areas have lower bandwidth. And so you want to utilize a codec that offers a good balance between quality and, um, and the ability to transport it to these devices in these low bandwidth areas. Um, a few things more about uh, encoding since I've talked about rip bit rates. When you, or back in the original or the, the older days when we were first learning about how to encode video for transmission, uh, there was something called constant bitrate. This is where every frame in the, the video file would basically be compressed to about the same size uh, using quantization matrices, etc. Um, constant bitrate is okay, but it leads to you know, inefficiencies and uh, kind of large files or smaller files with poor quality. There's this concept called variable bitrate encoding that takes into account how much change there is within a particular scene. So you can see in this slide here which the images at the bottom are borrowed from Big Buck Bunny. Um, in a, a scene that has low motion, you, or the, your codec or your encoder, sorry, um, will be able to compress it more because there's less information that has to be carried between frames. Uh, as the scene changes and there, there happens to be moderate motion, for instance, then the encoder could uh, detect this and use a higher bitrate 
to encode that part of the, the scene in the video. Uh, and then if it dropped down, it could go back to a lower bit rate. And then if it was really high motion, that is lots of deltas between the frames, um, it can go into an even higher uh, bit rate form. So you get all this kind of like bursting and, and dropping. It's, it's the way the graph is listed there in the white line, where it sort of goes up and down uh, as the encoding takes place. Um, so variable bit rate encoding, uh, it, its requirements depend on a few things. One happens to do with the complexity of, of the image and its resolution. So, you know, obviously the bigger the image you're trying to encode, the more space it's going to need. Um, and the, the various codecs that exist out there treat uh, the compression part of it differently. So something you'll have to factor in. Um, there are differences between the frames. So an action movie versus a talking head movie, uh, you could use the same codec, same settings, and you might notice uh, even if they were the same temporal length, that is the same as 10 minutes, they might be uh, encoded into files that vary differently. So one might be you know, a, a gigabyte, and the other one might be 200 megabytes. Um, so variable bit rate encoding in summary, sort of, it's encoding adapts by uh, lowering the bit rate for simple scenes and bursts of high bit rate when it's needed. Um, typical parameters include setting an average bit rate over a 10 to 30 second period where it allows for bursts that go maybe up to 150 percent of whatever the normal bandwidth is. Um, an encoder that, that will provide variable bit rate encoding, uh, it needs to have the ability to sort of look ahead, so it needs a, you know, some form of buffering uh, to absorb these bursts. Now, this is true on the encoding side and also on the decoding side. So some of you may be familiar with when you, you start a video online, like, I don't know, pick your favorite uh, uh, content provider online. You might notice it takes a couple of seconds for that uh, first frame to start showing and the video to start playing. This is actually due to, uh, you know, the client side buffering up the information or enough information so it can start decoding the video. Um, Average bit rate, which I've mentioned, uh, the encoder will attempt to reach a target average bit rate in the, uh, or file size while allowing for the bit rate to vary between the different parts of the media. Uh, essentially what this means is when you are encoding your video, uh, you have the ability to say, hey, I want to have the average bit rate be, say, half a megabit. Then the encoder is going to take that and use that as, as kind of like a bar. And as it's going through the video, it will try and achieve that target average um, but it won't always honor it in a strict way across the whole video. As I've demonstrated in the last few slides, it will maybe drop below when it's appropriate, and it might go as high as 150% above the average bit rate if it's necessary to, to encode a very complicated scene. Um, so, you know, bit, which bit rate should you strive for? Uh, how do you make these decisions? Where, you know, where does this all come into play? Like I said uh, a short time ago, the the availability of bandwidth varies by geographic location and how much someone is willing to pay. So these, these numbers that I put on the slide here are just based on a quick rough survey, nothing really scientific. But for about $10 a month, you can get two megabits of bandwidth in a typical city or, or uh, urban environment. For $99 a month, you can get 20 megabits down. And for $70 a month, you can get a whole terabyte uh, megabits downwards. But that's in Kansas City only. Uh, Sorry if, if you really want that for $70 a month. Um, so if you're lucky enough to live in Kansas City and you, you've got Google Fiber, um, you don't have bandwidth problems. Um, so consider carefully uh, how much encoding or what kind of encoding trade-off you want to make with your video after you've produced it. Now, I want to talk about live streaming. Um, live streaming is something that seeks to remedy some of the problems between deciding what you should encode at and delivering to people with varying bandwidth levels. Now, HLS, HTTP live streaming, uh, it's a pretty elegant um, solution to, to this problem. Essentially, you take a video file and you pass it through an HLS encoder. And what the encoder is going to do is actually encode into uh, at least three different uh, bit rates. So you'll have a low bit rate, you'll have a medium bit rate, and you'll have a high bit rate. And you know, in the end, it'll produce three video files. I'm using a very simple case here. Those three video files represent, say, you know, half a megabit, a full megabit, or two megabits, and maybe five megabits. And you know, you have different degrees of quality in those videos. They're all tied together with something called an index file. Now, this index file, uh, it's 
typically XML. There's different formats out there. I'm going to talk briefly about M3U8. Um, and I've got an example on the next slide. Essentially, um, M3U8 indexes this high, medium, and low encoding of the video. And a client player, say, you know, let's say Google TV, um, which has loaded an M3U8 file, uh, knows how to jump between the high, medium, and low streams based on the bandwidth availability as the video is being delivered. Um, typically, it uses things like quality of service, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, to determine when it should switch between high, medium, or low. Um, but the essential story is you can use HLS to create uh, multiple video streams of the same video content but at different quality levels and let the client choose which one to jump to uh, based on what's available bandwidth-wise for the user. Now something else I'm going to point out here, some of the more advanced uh, encoders allow you to do time splicing in the video too. So instead of having to choose one continuous low, medium, or high video feed, typically the encoder will also slice the video temporally. So you'll have maybe 10 to 30 second chunks of low. So let's say we had a 10 minute video and uh, we had set our encoder to chunk it into one minute intervals. So I'm watching this and, and you know my bandwidth is such that I'm getting the medium feed to begin with. And so I'm, I'm fed that first minute of medium video to my client and it's playing. All of a sudden, you know, my wife jumps on to her computer and starts downloading something large and my bandwidth sort of gets squeezed out a little bit. After that minute is up, uh, the, the client player uh, on Google TV is going to notice that the bandwidth has sort of dropped off and the buffer is emptying, so it might switch me to the low feed for that next minute segment. And so I would continue to watch the video and, and see this you know, lower quality video, but it's still playing. And then my wife's done downloading her file, and my bandwidth skyrockets uh, up to, you know, let's say, 5 megabits I have now. Now, the client player is going to detect that the buffer is waiting, or no, sorry, is, is constantly full, and uh, that it could actually pull more. So it makes the decision then to switch to the high stream for that next one-minute segment. So this is you know, in a nutshell, how HLS works. Um, and there's there are various encoders you can use. I believe you can pull this off with FFmpeg. FFmpeg don't quote me on that. Uh, Apple, I believe, produces uh, some media encoders. There's some third-party ones out there. Uh, I'm not going to make any official recommendation, but you can search for this using your favorite search engine and uh, discover uh, some of the details of an encoder that might work for your platform. Um, so as I've already stated, um, a manifest file, which is the M3U8 file in the example I just gave, it's an index file containing links to the actual media files. Each media file is referenced and has a different bit rate. Um, so what a typical, you know, what, what an example manifest file would look like is something like this. You have, you know, manifest of XML and you've got the namespace and then you would have some media references. So media with an href pointing to the low bitrate file, and then it has a bitrate attribute that specifies what its bitrate is. And then you might have one for medium specifying its bitrate. You might have one for high and its bitrate. Um, these files can actually get kind of complicated, especially if you start getting into uh, temporally chunking up your, your video. Your encoder should take care of all of the gory details, but the interesting thing to note is you can, you can actually open this in an editor and uh, poke around and take a look if you need to debug something or a stream isn't working the way you expected. Um, it, it gives you a point with which to debug uh, any problems you might be having. Um, so I'm not going to go too deep into the details of this. This is about uh, the, the extent that I'm going to cover this part, but there's a lot of information uh, that is available that can explain all the gory details of this and how to encode your media files. Uh, I just wanted to make you guys aware of this. Um, I'd already talked about the track jumping. I guess I should have moved to this slide when I explained it, but uh, just track jumping again. Uh, you can see here it's kind of an example between the different uh, time points in the video where bandwidth is increasing as we move from left to right, and then after we hit uh, T3 there, my bandwidth starts to get choked off again, so I start to gracefully degrade um, into the low range again. Um, now, how easy is this to implement if you're just doing a web app for Google TV? Pretty darn simple. Um, you can use the uh, HTML5 video tag. So if you use you know, video with the source pointing to your M3U8 file 
and you can add attributes like controls and autoplay. Um, that's all you need to do. So if your video is deployed on a CDN or a web server somewhere, um, if you you know literally put this line of code in your you know website or web page and load it on Google TV, it will start playing. Um, this is not true if you try and put this in just basic Chrome uh, or Firefox for that matter. It would work on Mac under Safari because I think they implemented it. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is this works on Google TV. It's not guaranteed to work uh, on all other uh, browsers. There is mixed support for it, but it does work on Google TV. Uh, so a nice, simple, elegant way to, to get a video at a web page. Um, this is sort of, this fits with the standard ways of doing video delivery on the web using Flash or HTML5. Um, some people have, have noted that there's a, a problem with the latest version of Flash uh, on Google TV. Uh, we're looking at that, but there, there really isn't too much we can do because it is an Adobe product and they're the ones who are responsible for maintaining it. So uh, consider carefully if you're going to use you know, the latest version of Flash for distribution on Google TV. Uh, make sure you test and that the version actually works. Uh, we, of course, support um, a lot of the HTML5 video players, uh, not in WebView, but definitely in Chrome. Now we get to talk about my, I don't want to say my favorite topic, but certainly one that uh, breeds a lot of controversy, uh, and that would be DRM, which is another aspect of, of sort of advanced video um, in this space. And I really like this graphic. I like the blue and the, the digit stuff. I'm not sure how well it's showing up on the Hangouts, but um, I think it looks cool. So DRM in a nutshell. HTTP or, uh, yeah, so HLS in and of itself, even if you use AEN, AES encryption, it's not DRM. You're simply protecting the, uh, the video transmission, not the content itself. DRM is defined as having three core things, one being license management, the other being transport encryption, and the third one being secure decoding on a trusted video path within the client. Um, you might notice that sometimes you try and uh, play media content on, uh, say, a non-standard device, and it won't play. Well, that's usually because it's missing trusted video paths. Um, and you know, this is a this is a myth, or not a myth. It's a confusion I'm, tr I'm hoping to alleviate, where uh, the the term DRM is synonymous with these three things. Um, so license management, transport encryption, security coding on trusted video path. And Google TV has trusted video path SOCs. SOCs are uh, systems on a chip, and they are provided by uh, certain vendors and partners that we have that all integrate together and play nice in this, this video space. Um, so how does content protection work? Well, you have a server, and it's serving up uh, you know, some form of video file, say, or media file. and it's going to send along an encryption key with that file to the device. And that device uses that encryption key to decrypt the video file for playback. Now, in Google TV's case, it's playing the role of the device here. So it needs to receive this uh, encryption key from uh, you know, whatever server is offering it. And then it uses that to decrypt the video file. And then it's going to pass it along another secure channel, that is HDMI with HDCP, um, Google TV has imbued in it the HDCP keys that allow it to communicate over HDMI to uh, secure screens like televisions um, to play back that content on the screen. So there's actually like <clears throat> two forms of encryption and decryption going on uh, on the whole video path from wherever the content is being served from to the screen that it's being served on. Um, so I'm going to walk you through sort of a, a typical scenario here. You've got Google TV, and it, needs, it, it wants to watch some URL. So it goes, hey, content server, can I please watch this URL? And the content server says, well, uh, you could, but you need a license. You need to go here and get this. Here's the URL. Go here and take care of licensing. So you know, Google TV's client then goes to that URL for the license. So it asks the license server, hey, um, can I get a license for this? And the license server says, no, you need to pay for that. Go here. Uh, go here to make payment. So then Google TV's client uh, posts payment data to the payment server, and the payment server will inform the license server that this particular client has paid for it, and it, the payment server will send a token back to the, the client on the Google TV, and then the Google TV will ask for the license again from the license server, providing the token that it received from the payment server. The license server will then go, hey, you paid. Here's your URL unlock with a license key on a separate channel. Um, 
And then Google TV will go back to the content server with the URL and provide some form of license key validation. And the content server will start sending encrypted data back that the, the client can play. So in a nutshell, uh, this is a very simplistic view, by the way, of, of how you know, DRM works uh, for illustrative purposes only. But you know, through these mechanisms, this is how DRM kind of works. Um, Back to trusted video pass for a minute. So I mentioned SOCs. So SOCs are systems on a chip. They're isolated from the open circuits that handle application code. So on a Google TV device, uh, there is circuitry that handles the Android operating system and all the application space stuff that goes on. And then there's a completely separate and isolated uh, set of circuits that handle the uh, trusted video path content. So this is the thing, these are things that come in over um, uh, through Wi-Fi, play ready, uh, and make their way to the the actual video screen. Now, this prevents access to the raw bits that represent the media frames uh, from any of the application data. There's requests a lot of the time for, hey, can I access the content that's coming in from the HDMI input? Well, no, you can't, and this is kind of why. Uh, Android doesn't have access to that. It's it's all on this separate circuitry area. So. Uh, that keeps the content safe and protected for the, the content owners. Um, the DRM key decryption is completely isolated from Android as well. This again is where SOCs come in. They're, they're circuits on a chip. It's uh, I would find it remarkably difficult to try and you know pop a chip open and solder things on there. I don't think that that's that's a reasonable thing to do anyway. But um, all of this is to uh, to help bring premium content from the big content producers to your TV through Google TV uh, and, and build services on top of. So I just wanted to cover a little bit about Trusted Video Pass there. Um, so as I've, as I've mentioned, uh, Google TV, we're trying to keep your content safe. Uh, so we have several DRM components, one being that we're built on the Android DRM uh, framework, which, you know, it manages the playback rights of, of content through that uh, illustration I gave a, a few slides ago. Um, we support Widevine and PlayReady. Uh, it's built into the platform and uh, will continue to be supported. We have Trusted Video Path, as I've mentioned, and it keeps your uh, decrypted video data securely in the hardware sandbox. Uh, it protects your stream media securely, so if you're uh, transmitting your media using Widevine or PlayReady, um, it will utilize the, uh, the Trusted Video Path for that media playback. Uh, as I mentioned a few slides ago as well, the HDMI content protection protects the video content all the way to the television set. So this offers end-to-end uh, -end protection of the media as it moves from the internet or cable provider through to your video screen. A little bit about the Android DRM stack. You can read a lot more about this, by the way, on the Android site. So you can go to, uh, I believe it's developer.android.com. Uh, you search for DRM, and you can you can read up on a lot of the gory details of, of how this is implemented. Now, on traditional Android, um, the DRM framework is offered as a software package where you can actually build additional DRM solutions, custom ones, um, but those typically require native code, and uh, they're, they're difficult to develop. Now, Google TV being uh, a slightly different type of Android device, we don't support NDK, uh, and I think I saw a question for that in the Dory, so I'll get around to answering why when we get to that. Um, so because of this, uh, developers are not able to provide their own solutions, and we go ahead and use the same Android DRM framework, but with our code and put it into the Google TV stack so it's available. So if you have a really compelling DRM solution that is in wide use by uh, large content, producers or providers, then you know you should let me know and, and, and I'll put a, a, a feature request in and see if we can get it rolled into the stack as well. Um, a couple things about Widevine, which is a uh, Google-owned DRM solution. You can go to widevine.com to find out all sorts of wonderful things about it. Uh, a few quick facts. It's supported by about a a 540 million devices, including 284 television or 284 million television and set-top boxes. So that's it's got some wide adoption out there. Uh, it supports adaptive streaming and quality of service controls. Uh, PlayReady, which I've mentioned also, uh, it was developed by Microsoft uh, with collaboration within the PC, TV, and mobile industry. It also supports uh, adaptive streaming and quality of service. You can go to microsoft.com slash PlayReady to learn more about the details of it there. 
Um, PlayReady itself, uh, the DRM for Google TV, it's, you know, ARM-based Google TV devices, that is, the newer models that are on the market will include support for PlayReady. Uh, the older ones, I think, are lacking some of the chipsets that are required to pull this off, so just be aware uh, if you are going to use PlayReady, um, that that might be a problem. Um, it's implemented as a plugin on the DRM framework, which I've already mentioned. Uh, it supports license acquisition through uh, the APIs and the management tools. It's extensible to adapt to custom license servers, um, and we can play back through the trusted video path hardware. So an example, an Android example, a nice simple Android example. Um, what you can do is actually write uh, an Android application that plays back video in about four lines of code. And if you're clever, you can do it in three lines of code. <laughs> uh, so essentially, you want to take a URL. Let's say we took an M3U8 URL. Create a string, drop your URL in there, uh, create a video view object, and uh, you, know, you can use your declarative layout to sort of place a video view and then just grab it. Um, you set video view dot set video path to the URL that you placed in your string, and then you do video view start. And guess what? You'll have video playing on your Google TV. Four lines of really simple code. Um, this is a good way to sort of start playing with uh, you know just layouts that include video. As you move into the more complicated stuff, there's a lot of tutorials online that can help you. Uh, you know, evolve your video solution. If you want to start getting into um, you know, media control, play, pause, rewind, skip ahead, uh, that's what I mean by the more advanced stuff. Um, we have documentation on that. I'm not going to be covering that today uh, due to time limitations, but I wanted to make you aware of it and, and sort of those of you who have not written a Google TV application yet, this is a really good way to test it, especially if you have a device. There's nothing more compelling than plugging in a few lines of code and seeing something on the screen. I know that's what excites me anyway. Um, I've mentioned quality of service a few times. And um, where quality of service comes in and why it's important is if you are, let's say you're a large content producer and you're offering videos for people to rent. Um, you know, some big company maybe that starts with an A. Uh, you want to pay attention to the quality of the video that the user is watching. Um, if I've spent, say, five bucks to rent a movie and you know I've paid for it to be in HD and I'm playing it and my bandwidth starts to taper off and it drops down to the standard qual or standard definition uh, video, then am I getting what I'm paying for? How can an application detect when a certain you know, quality threshold hasn't been met. Do I get a partial refund? Do I get a complete refund? What happens if my bandwidth completely drops off and I don't get to enjoy the whole video? Um, this is where quality of service comes in. So we have quality of service APIs that allow you to monitor the video playback while the video is streaming. Um, this is typically implemented using uh, a listener pattern. So you would implement a uh, media player on info listener and you would get uh, you would register your listener with the media player and it would notify you of info events periodically that you could monitor. So you get like current frames per second, um, you can get how much space is left in the buffer. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of you know, really valuable statistical data you can grab uh, through the QoS APIs that would allow you to make an informed decision as to, hey, has this customer actually received the quality of service that you know, we offered them when, when they paid for it. Um, so again, you can implement this very easily. Uh, you just need to, again, create a, a listener that implements media player dot on info listener. I'm not going to cover the code specifics, uh, again, due to time limitations, but you can go to developers.google.com slash TV and uh, jump in and find out more about QoS. If you have questions about QoS, feel free to send me an email, crispy at google.com. I'll I'll do my best to answer it. Even better, though, is if you post your question on Stack Overflow and, and label it with Google TV, because then I can find it, I can answer it, and other people can enjoy the benefits of that answer um, you know, in the future, as opposed to me just receiving one email and responding one off again and again. So I'm going to revise that. Post your question on Stack Overflow, and, and I will find it and answer it. Um, I'm going to mention the YouTube Android Media APIs. These were announced initially at I.O. 
Um, we're still waiting for them to, to go public. Um, I'm anticipating soon. I don't know when, though. Um, what the uh, YouTube Android Media API allows for is playing back high-quality video content uh, on Android devices, and this includes Google TV. Um, you can write uh, code that, that you know, creates your own YouTube channels and, and adds maybe levels of interactivity around this. Essentially, it's, it's you know, an API that allows you to have a video view that is you know, tied to uh, content on YouTube. So there's a link at the bottom there, http colon slash slash goo dot gl slash capital V for the capital G E. That's the uh, that's a link to the video presentation that was given at I.O. Uh, I think it's about an hour long. It's worth watching if you're interested in this. Um, and it's expected soon. I don't know when, unfortunately. Um, I've got a QR code. I don't think it'll do you much good in the video stream. I'm not sure how good that's going to come out. But uh, Google TV apps can now play high-quality content, as I've alluded to. Um, stay tuned for this. Uh, I will be touting it you know, the Wednesday after it's launched, whenever that happens to be. Um, so be aware of it. That Oh, great. We're at the last slide. That kind of brings me to the, the end of these slides, and we can jump into questions, which is awesome, because I wanted to leave enough time to get to these questions. While I'm transferring over here, um, has anybody got any live questions that I can answer? Nobody? Everybody's shy today? <laughs> All right. Um, I am just going to call up the, the moderator, and uh, let's see if we can't answer a couple of questions here. Oh, I'm going to the wrong place, apparently. It's the first time I've done this without Les here for a while. Right. There you go. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I just wanted to do a quick introduction for you. Sure. Uh, this is Vikran. Hi. Hi, Vikran. How are you? And we have William, who's uh, another lead here. Hello. So, yeah, well, I just had them jump in, uh, join the Hangout, and looking at the presentation. Awesome. Was it? Uh, did it come across clear enough? Yeah, I, I think. Do we have access to the PowerPoint after? Um, I'm going to make these slides available soon. Uh, I, I've been, I've been pulled in many different directions over the last few weeks, and I am behind on getting my slides published. What I will do uh, when they are published is I will put a post in the Google Plus, uh, Google Developers TV, uh, page, and also probably mention it in the next Hangout um, that we're going to do. So also, I guess, to fill you guys in, we are moving to a two-week format uh, for Hangouts. We're not going to do it every week now. We're going to do it every two weeks, partially because uh, we have a lot of things going on right now, and uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time to prepare um, Hangouts that are of a certain quality uh, and value to you guys. So uh, this gives you guys enough time to, to ask a lot of questions in the, the glory and, uh, or the moderator. Sorry, if you can mute, I hear a lot of, uh, let's see, can I mute him? Yay, muted. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to move to a two-week format. Uh, there's going to be some more planning that goes on in here. We're going to try and uh, spruce up the quality level of these, these Hangouts, so just be aware. It won't be every week. It'll be every two weeks now. Um, all right. If there's no other live questions right now, I'm going to jump right into the questions. So we have five questions this this week. Uh, is there any way to tell the live TV stream to be quiet? I've tried requesting audio focus, but it doesn't seem to be working. I'd rather not have to pop out, pop the user out of live TV. This is by Yossi. Hmm. Um, my understanding is that the live TV app should actually be respecting audio focus. If it's not. Uh, and admittedly, I haven't tested this. Um, if it's not doing that, please file a, a bug. Uh, I think it's Google TV issues. Um, yeah, please go there and provide as much detail as you can, and uh, I'll have someone take a look at that if, if that's not behaving. Also, if you have an APK that you don't mind sharing with me, uh, send it my way, and I can install it on uh, one of the devices I have that uses live stream or uh, the, the direct stream from a, a cable provider. We'll, we'll see... Uh, We'll see if, if it's a problem on 
your device or all devices or what have you. Uh, okay, next question. Integration with my DVR ATTU verse works but can be cumbersome. Uh, is there any way to improve the IR code mapping so that I can set up a button that triggers record TV on my DVR remote? Is there an API for the IR repeater? That's a really great question. Um, unfortunately, the answer is no, um, mainly because I don't think it's an exposed API yet. But I think it would make an interesting feature. So I guess the answer to this one is uh, put in a feature request, provide a little bit more detail than you have here, use case, etc. And uh, I can make sure that the right eyeballs see that. And uh, we can see what we can do about it. Next question is, when will Google TV start supporting NDK to make apps? So. Interesting thing about NDK. Uh, I've answered this a few times. I've jumped into the, the, the issues forum, and I, I posted an answer there. I don't think this is going to go away. Um, I want NDK, too. Uh, the reality is we can't have it yet, and it's mainly because of some of the legacy work that went on in supporting Chrome in the, the earlier generations of Google TVs. Uh, technical trade-offs had to be made, and the unfortunate consequence of that is that um, NDK is not supported. Now, at the time this decision was made, NDK really wasn't a huge part of the whole stack, and, and we didn't quite know how it was going to hook in. So we recognize that NDK is important to a lot of developers who want to produce, uh, I guess, games specifically and a few other things uh, on Google TV. I'm fighting for you guys. I'm, I'm trying really hard to get NDK going. Um, everyone here has heard me and is aware of it. These things take a little bit of time uh, to, to make happen. It's unfortunately not just flipping a bit here or there. Uh, there's some, some large changes that we're, we're hoping to make, which in the future should allow for this. Um, so unfortunately, my answer for this is stay tuned. Um, just, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> I have nothing else to announce at this time. Um, next question. Is there a Google TV API to support stereoscopic 3D content? Ooh, I like that. Um, and there's a link here to Stack Overflow. It says, uh, FYI, LG Google TV has 3D World application that supports 3D. Yes, it does. Uh, and I've used it, and I kind of like it. I, I dig the feature. I, I do think like stereoscopic 3D is a little bit of a gimmick. Like You don't want to be using it all the time. But there are times when it's appropriate. And I think it would be cool to be able to build using some form of stereoscopic 3D API. Does it exist? Uh, no. no. Uh, it's unfortunate, but make, it, it would make an interesting feature request. I'd say put it in. Yes, LG has it. Um, LG is the only one that has it, and LG is uh, an OEM partner, so they have a certain level of access to things that uh, the general public doesn't, and this, this covers all sorts of business cases that I'm not going to get into. Um, suffice it to say, it, it's not available. I think it would be compelling, so Jared, please um, please file a feature request. And, and again, I'll, I'll make sure that the right people see it, uh, and we'll see what we can do, but I can't make any promises. All right, uh, I hope that works for an answer. That's the best I can give right now. Uh, last question on this list is, do you see AR for Google TV GUI coming someday? So I'm going to make a leap because I could infer all sorts of meanings for AR. I'm going to suppose it means augmented reality. Um, I don't know. I mean, it would be kind of weird to have augmented reality within the GUI. Um, parts of this would probably require um, <clears throat> some form of access to the, the direct video overlay, and, and that might be an issue if the content is being delivered uh, through DRM. Um, I could see it happening in the future at some point. I think a lot of things would have to change. I think a lot of the laws would have to change, um, and a lot of the you know sort of copyrights and patents and privacy and, and whatnot. I think it'd be cool. Um, you know, if you're passionate about stuff like that, my recommendation is, you know, maybe create an ignite talk or ignite presentation and, and start putting that idea out in front of you know, crowds of passionate people and see what you get as feedback and then, you know, try and make it happen. Uh, if you come up with some really compelling cases for it and, you know, can demonstrate that there's demand and a need, then, you know, if that message gets heard, then maybe the maybe all the right things could happen in the future. So I realize that's sort of a wishy-washy answer. Um, did I answer it? Well, yes and no. 
<laughs> but uh, that's unfortunately the nature of this this kind of an industry in space is the, there's it's rare that you get a, a blunt yes or no uh, unless you're asking about a specific feature yes no um, I've got no more questions that are on the door or the, the moderator I keep calling it Dory that's our internal name for it uh, I don't see anything oh, I see a few questions in the chat stream here uh, invite please, invite please. For those who are trying to get on the Hangout, uh, you just have to go to developers.google.com slash live and there is a link I believe from there on YouTube or you can go to our pages and click on join event. I got nothing else guys so if there's no other questions, oh, Jason I, go ahead. I had one question. Is there a, a file size limit on the APK for Google TV? Um, well, you've got a hard physical limitation. I would not go over two gigabytes. In fact, I would question going over 50 right. megabytes. Um, right, right. There's not a lot of storage space on, on Google TVs. There's, uh, you know, I think the standard right now is about four gigs. Uh, okay. I believe one of the models has eight gigs, but um, you want to keep your APKs as small as possible. And okay. uh, I think if you want to bundle a lot of assets or content, make those available after the fact so that way they can be loaded and unloaded. Um, okay. That's sort of my suggestion there. And then I, I had another question. Did the, um, the Google TV data sharing library, is that going to be updated or out or released? I don't know. I actually haven't touched those, but you know what? I can ask, uh, I can ask one of the other guys on the team uh, what the status of that is. Maybe uh, send me an email just to remind me so I don't forget, okay. and I'll I'll figure that out and uh, make a post or put it update the documentation or something. Okay. All right. Did you enjoy the hangout? Yeah. You were very quiet today. <laughs> I know I was doing a lot of the talking, but that's okay. All the information is wonderful. <laughs> and I'm I'm learning as everybody is doing as the same way. Cool. You guys are the ones who are at Hangout Live here with me. Are uh, you guys finding this valuable? Is this should I keep up this format going forward? I, I definitely like the slides. All right. Um, so I, I'll prepare something uh, for two weeks from now. I believe I'm. Yeah. So two weeks from now, uh, we'll do another one. I'll figure out the topic this week and I'll, I'll start posting it so you guys know uh, what questions to start asking or thinking about. All right. So with that, I will bid you adieu. And uh, we'll tune in in two weeks and reconnect. All right, guys? Alrighty. Take care. Bye.